Thanks for coming. Let's get started. Today we have Eric Weingarten from Colombia, and he's going to tell us about approximate nearest neighbors to a nonlinear spectral gap. Okay. Uh, thanks. So I'll talk about the, these two papers we've had this past year um, with some co-authors, Alex Andoni, Asaf Naur, Alexander Nikolov, and Neil Rajenstein. And yeah, please feel free to stop me at any moment. And yeah. Okay. So let me first set up the main algorithmic problem. This is the approximate near neighbor problem, and it's a data structure problem. So the task is the following. At the beginning, I'll get some data set P, and this will be endpoints in um, RD, in the dimensional space. And I want to somehow arrange these points into a data structure such that in the future, you're going to come with a new point Q. So this will be some like other point, and it's going to promise, and you're going to give me the promise that there's a point P where the distance is at most one. Okay? And now you need to do some computation on this point given this query, accessing the data structure, such that you can return any point from the data set P prime within distance at most C. So C here is a parameter bigger than one, and the answer that you return is an approximation to the near neighbor P. Okay? Uh, good. So what are sort of the main things that we care about, and what parameters do we care? Um, here we want to design data structures which optimize the approximation factor C, so ideally get this value to be as close to one as possible, while keeping the total space of the data structure that we use small, and the query time which is really fast. In particular, we want to do better than scanning the entire data set. So, yeah. Good. And I want you to think about all this taking place in the high dimensional regime, and all this means is that if my underlying vectors, my points, are in d dimensions, I want my dependence on d to be at most a polynomial. So I don't want exponential dependence on the dimension. And for this talk, you should really think about like random instances. And all that means is that the data set, just think of it as being sampled IID from all the possible points you would ever observe. And then the query will be given by picking one data set and sampling a random point within distance one. This is some like uh, a relaxation of the problem. Okay, so okay, let me give you the ideal theorem that I would like to prove, or the sort of the dream data structure in this case. So I'd like to say the following: If I fix a norm space over R D, so this will measure a way to measure my distances in my space, and any epsilon greater than zero, I want to say that there exists a data structure for solving the approximate nearest neighbor problem over this particular norm which gets approximation, which is order one over epsilon using space which is polynomial in d times n to the one plus epsilon and query time polynomial in d times n to the epsilon. So in some <coughs> sense, I have this like small epsilon, think about this as being like 0.1, and then I'm giving up a little bit on the space, so I want to use like polynomially more space and set up the data structure, but now instead of scanning the whole data set, I get like poly d times n to the 0.1 query time. And n for the rest of the talk will be the number of points in the data set, and d will be the underlying dimension of the vector space. Are there any questions? This is like uh, sort of the, what I would hope to prove. Why wouldn't you hope for better? Are all of these uh, parameters clearly uh, lower bound? Right, so it's kind of tricky to do lower bounds for these kinds of like data structure problems. Yeah. Like we don't have many, like if you restrict the model to all the techniques that we know how to design algorithms for, then yes, we can prove that in some sense all these things are tight. Even for like the exact constants inside the O epsilon or you, know. so you said the data set was random, what was the distribution? Right, I'm just saying that just like it so in reality it's not. You want to oh. dig worst case data sets. But for the sake of this talk, it's like useful to think of the random instance. Oh okay. Yeah. Okay. Okay, so the prior work on this problem has really focused on when the underlying distance measure is given by the L1 or L2 norm. So just when the underlying measure is these two norms, and the main tool here, like the, the catch-all phrase for these data structures are these randomized space partitions, or if you heard of locality sensitive hashing or LSH. It's like the main idea is that you want to somehow partition your underlying vector space and design a hash function from this so that close points will likely collide under the hash function. Okay, and it's been studied for a long time. Um, 
And for the case of L1 and L2, I can actually, we know how to achieve this ideal theorem that I described. So basically already in 1998, these two papers by Indik Motuani and Kushilevi Sotsrovsky Rubani, they show that for any epsilon, there exists a data structure for approximate nearest neighbors over L1 and L2, which achieves approximation, which is one over epsilon using space D times n to one plus epsilon and query times D times n to the epsilon. So already we know on these specific metric spaces how to achieve this ideal scenario. Okay, uh, this work is really about going beyond L1 and L2, and the high level question is, if I give you any norm space over RD, what's the particular property of that norm space that's gonna allow me to make um, data structures for approximate nearest neighbors under this particular norm space? Okay. And just as a quick recap, whenever I just say norm space, all I'm gonna assume is that I have some distance function which basically measures the distance from zero for any vector and then it satisfies the axioms of a norm, and then the distance between two points is given by subtracting the two vectors and computing this function. Okay. And, right, so if you've worked with these norm spaces before, there's this very natural correspondence between the norm space and the symmetric convex bodies. And basically what you do is you take all the points, all the vectors, with distance at most one from the origin, and this is basically the, we call the unit ball. So let me give you some examples. For instance, in the natural norm, the L2 norm, which is given by the sum of squares, and then you take the square root. Then the natural, all the points with norm at most one is just given by just the usual sphere. But this is not only just a thing of L2. We can define the L1 ball, or the Manhattan norm, is the sum of the absolute values of the coefficients. And you get this convex body. And when I talk about arbitrary norm, I can think about arbitrary um, convex <coughs> bodies which are symmetric across the origin. That means that if x is in the body, then minus x is also in the body. So really I want to be thinking about these like general convex bodies and ask what's the geometry of, of this convex body that allows me to design efficient data structures. Okay, great. Good, let me give you sort of a first approach and the natural way that these things have been solved is the embeddings approach. So what this basically means is that, okay, I want to design a reduction between these geometric problems. And in particular, <coughs> this means I want a function f which maps a particular space x into a particular space y where I think of y as nice. So think of y as being like L1 and L2. And now if I can do that, I want, sorry, so I want my function to satisfy that distances in x are approximately preserved once I map these points individually as distances in y. So in some sense, if you have this, then uh, algorithm for a natural problem defined on these distances, which is followed by taking all your points, I'll apply my function from x to y, and now, in some sense, I need to solve the problem in y, but y is nice, so I'll use known data structure. Okay? So we can see to what extent this embeddings approach can take us, like for general norms, and you can already ask, okay, what's the best embeddings from uh, any norm into like some nice space like L2 for which we know data structures. And already we can use something pretty nice and already in 1948, so Fritz John proved the following theorem. If you have any norm space X over RD, then there exists an invertible linear map. So think about this as the particular embedding that you'll use, the function, and it's, you can implement it as a linear map, such that if you have any two points in RD, the distance between these points in the norm space X is up to factor square root d, the distance between the two points after applying the linear map in L2. So in some sense, this reduces the problem of um, understanding distances in any norm to that of understanding the problem in L2, but you lose this factor of square root d, okay? Equivalently, we can look at what this says about the convex bodies for any norm, and what Fritz John is saying is that if you take any k, which is an origin symmetric convex body, then there exists an ellipsoid, which is basically just the unit sphere um, transformed by a linear map, such that the ellipsoid is fully contained within the body, and square root d times the ellipsoid contains a convex body. So the picture to have in mind is the following. We start here with like a general origin symmetric convex body, we wrap it inside and outside with a unit sphere, with the L2 ball. Okay. And this, this map, sort of going from distances in here to distances in here, you lose this factor square root d. Okay. So we can already, now, okay, we have a reduction. We can apply 
<coughs> the data structure of Indic Matuani, Gushi Levi, Satoshi Rabani, and conclude that for any norm space on any epsilon, there exists a data structure which gets approximation square root d over epsilon, where square root d is the loss in the embedding, and then over epsilon is the, um, the loss in the data structure for L2, using space and query time, which are the same as that of the L2 data structure. Okay? Good. And in this work, what we really try to do is try to go beyond this embeddings approach, and in particular, try to get approximation, which is better than this square root d. And what we're going for is like subpolynomial in d. Okay. So let me give you the meta result of these two papers is the following. We'll understand the algorithms for approximate nearest neighbors for norm space x by studying to what extent I can prove that expanders don't embed in my space. Okay. Or another way to think about this is saying that if your space contains expanders, then you can prove a lower bound. And f this is the only way to prove a lower bound. Basically, if you don't have expanders, then I'll give you an upper bound. That's the message. And the application is that we'll prove for any norm space x and any epsilon, there exists a data structure for x, which achieves approximation 2 to square root log d, so subpolynomial in d using space poly d times n to the 1 plus epsilon and query time poly d times n to the epsilon. Okay, so that's the main theorem. Are there any questions or? Yeah. yeah so, like, let's say I'm thinking about L1.5. Okay. If I take the map to be, like if I'm trying to reduce to L1 or L2, if I take the map to be like the powers of the entries of the vector. Right. Uh, like, and put the sign in afterwards. Okay, yeah. Uh, like, does this uh, work? Right, so this is known as the Maslow map. We'll actually, like, talk about this later. Um, yeah, so this specifically would, if you instantiate this as an embedding, you would be getting for L1.5 approximation something like, yeah, it's order P. You can do this for all the LP norms. Oh, yeah. Good. Um, okay, good. So let me give you an outline of the talk. We just talked about just a high-level overview of the a and problem. And now I want to discuss this cutting modulus and cell probe data structures, then we'll talk about geometric cuts. And finally, I'll try to um, talk about a little bit of how to go beyond John's ellipsoid, beyond the square root d factor. Yeah. Go, uh, slide back. Yeah. Uh, so in the previous, uh, if you just apply the theorem of John and the earlier result, you yeah. get root d over epsilon, right? Exactly, but yeah. But you get 2 to the square root log d yeah. divided by epsilon over square root log d. Right? Yeah. So yeah, it's, it's worse in terms of epsilon, okay. yeah. Right, so I, I guess I think of epsilon as being like 0.1. <coughs> okay, good. Um, okay, so let's go into this. And just to set up some notation, we'll, I'll, okay, let's just go over this. I'll think of a graph. This will be like a delta regular graph on m vertices. And then I'll refer to LG as a normalized Laplacian and the adjacency matrix. And then I can talk about the spectrum of this uh, normalized Laplacian. So lambda 1 will be the smallest uh, eigenvector, or sorry, smallest eigenvalue, which is always 0. And then I'll like, mostly focus on lambda 2. Okay, yeah. So does epsilon have to be constant for this? Could you like, set epsilon be 1 over log n to remove the uh, polynomial in n runtime in? <coughs> Like you have n to the epsilon query time, right? Could you say? Yeah, but but, but is, yeah. is there is there a bound on epsilon, or could, can you? No, just yeah, I think anything? yeah, you could. So you, could, so you, could do that. you just get like bad dependence. Huh? Yeah. Yeah. Um, okay, good. And I guess the main definition I want. So I'll refer to G as being an epsilon expander. If lambda two of the normalized Laplacian, I can look it down by epsilon squared. Okay, this so that I can apply Cheeger's inequality to the graph. Okay, so let me give you, I guess, the main, this like linear spectral gap inequality, which is, I, I don't know, I think it's a very nice way of translating between lambda two and thinking about like geometric concepts. So the inequality says the following, if you take a graph on M vertices, let's say it be any graph, and you map this graph into RD, so think about the graph living where the vertices are some high dimensional vectors, and they're like connected according to this graph structure, then I can do the following experiment and get this inequality. So I'll, if I sample two random vertices and compute the L2 distance squared between the two points, okay, this will give me some like measure of to what extent these points are clustered together. 
then this is always 1 over lambda 2 of the normalized Laplacian times the same experiment, but now I'll sample a random edge. So in some sense, I can understand to what extent my graph is spread out by understanding to what extent the edges are spread out. So, OK? You don't assume any regularity under the back? No. Well, well, I guess for, for this, yes. So, so, right, so the regularity here comes from like the particular distributions that I'm using. If I was unregular, I would need to sample these vertices according to different distributions. OK, but what is, uh, so OK, this is in some sense like a geometric statement relating distances of graphs once I think about these as being embedded into L2. And here's like a very simple geometric corollary. If you tell me that G is any graph and you embed this graph with a one Lipschitz embedding, all this means is that any two points that are adjacent with an edge won't be spread out, so they'll be at distance at most one. Then this expectation is always at most one. Okay? So what I can say is that either the points uh, contains an L2, are, have constant fraction of the points with an L2 ball of radius 1 over epsilon, or lambda 2 is at most epsilon squared. This is sort of very simple. If you say that my points are, either my points are clustered within an L2 ball of radius 1 over epsilon, or if they're not, this is telling me that my average distance between the points, if I square the distance, is more than 1 over epsilon squared, and then I get a lower, um, an upper bound on lambda 2. <coughs> so what this means is then I can apply Chigurh's inequality and from get a cut of the graph of conductance at most epsilon. Okay, is, is, it, is it clear? It's like a corollary from the above inequality. Okay. Okay, so now I'll define uh, a property of a metric space to be the value for which I can prove this corollary. So this is, gonna, this is just going to be a definition, but it's going to remind you of the corollary we just proved. Basically, I'll say that the cutting modulus C of a metric space X, this is the smallest radius such that for any graph and any one Lipschitz embedding, either I have a cluster of radius R, which contains a constant fraction of the points, or the, uh, the graph contains a cut of conductance at most epsilon. Okay, so this is just a definition saying, to what extent can I trade off the radius of the cluster and the conductance of the cut? Okay. So the picture is like this. You give me any set of points in this metric space, and I can say, okay, look, my points are clustered according to radius r. Or if the points are sort of spread out, then if I drew the graph obtained by connecting points within distance at most one, then the claim is that this graph has a cut of conductance at most epsilon. This is just the definition of the metric space. This is the property of a particular metric space. And what we saw was that L2 has cutting modulus at most 1 over epsilon. Right? Because either we have, so in the corollary, either we have a ball of radius 1 over epsilon containing a constant fraction, so either I can cluster the points or I can get a cut. Good. OK, so the main theorem of the first paper was really saying about um, how this notion, this cutting modulus, is basically all you need for data structures. And if you give me a metric space x of, let's say, dimension d, so think about the metric space as being defined over Rd, and you give me a bound on the cutting modulus, then I can design for any epsilon a cell probe data structure, which achieves approximation order of the cutting modulus using space poly d times n to the 1 plus epsilon and memory probes poly d times n to the epsilon. Okay, do people know what cell probe data structures are? Okay, good. So cell probe data structures, basically, I'm forgetting about computational constraints. I'm saying the data structure is just going to look into the memory and then do unlimited amount of computation. So it's really more of an information theory statement. <coughs> so in some, if you don't care about a computation, <coughs> I can design a data structure for which the querying procedure only looks at a few memory probes. Now, if you can make this efficient, then you'd get a full algorithm. OK, yeah? Uh, there's no dependence on the cutting modulus in the space or the number of probes. Right. Why is that? Um, well, <coughs> yeah, I'll, I mean, yeah, I guess it will be clear when I tell you how to prove this, but 
Basically, this, yeah, the way we did it is just you get a bound in the approximation. Okay. Um, let me give you sort of a flavor of how you would prove this result getting um, upper bound on the cutting modulus. And the idea is to design an LSH like function for a fine net of G, so for a fine net of X. So basically, think of a graph defined over all the possible points that the data structure could possibly see. This is just a discretization of all the points. So in some sense, yeah, so these points are all possible points which I could receive. So in particular, the data set would be a subset of size n from these points, but these points could be, like, in general, they'll be exponential in D. Okay? And now what I want to do, I want to design a partition of this underlying space using the bounds on the cutting modulus. Okay? And basically, I Right, so I, this is the particular metric space. I gave you one uh, property of the metric space, so all we can do is simply apply <coughs> this property. So in some sense, we'll look at this point, and then we can ask, okay, if there's a dense ball, is there like a cluster? And if there's no cluster, then I'm guaranteed by the <coughs> definition of the cutting modulus that there exists a cut of conductance at most epsilon. And then I'll simply divide my points according to whether they fall inside the cut or outside the cut, and I'll recurse on each side. So I can ask if there's a dense ball inside the cut, and if there's not, then I'll continue cutting the space. I'm always getting a cut of conductance at most epsilon. <coughs> and okay, for example, if at this point, now I observe there is a dense ball, this ball has radius at most given by the cutting modulus, so I'll just put it aside, <coughs> and then, right, and then I'll recurse on the points outside the ball, because the points inside the ball are already clustered. Good, so if you can repeat this, and then you get an underlying partition just given by where the points lie according to these cuts and balls. Okay. So, okay, so what am I going to do? I'll continue doing this procedure, and I'll stop when the underlying buckets have measure roughly 1 over n. Okay. And, right, this will mean that this particular tree has depth log n, and each node Either it's a ball, either it's a cluster, or there's a cut which separates at most an epsilon fraction of the edges. This is like a rough calculation. And what's the sort of the main work here is that actually you can encode each step of the tree, whether it's a ball or a cut, with only poly d times log n bits. This is like the main work in the paper. Um, right, and I guess. Here, this is kind of surprising, just because this graph, we're thinking about this as being exponential in D. And somehow I'm encoding the cut that I need to take only using polynomial in D many bits. Okay, so once I have this partition, how does the data structure work? It's very simple. During pre-processing, I'll simply traverse down the tree and store each data set point in the bucket that it lies in. Okay? And during the query, I'll take my query and traverse the tree and check in the bucket if I have a point which is approximately a near neighbor. So very straightforward. So what's the analysis? Well, each time I do this, at the end, there's going to be constant number of points. And this was because the measure of the underlying bucket was 1 over n, and I sampled n points in the random instance. And the analysis is that the probability that the p, like the true near neighbor p, and the query q lie in the same bucket is at least the probability that they're never split. And this is 1 minus epsilon to the log n, so it's n to the minus epsilon. <coughs> so in some sense, if I could repeat this random instance, n to the epsilon times, then I would get success uh, at least once. OK? <coughs> OK, good. So now we can take this sort of data structure with an ideal bound with some bound on the cutting modulus and see, okay, to what extent we can get bounds now on the cutting modulus. And now we can use this inequality that Asaf Naur proved in 2017. He basically said that this, linear, this spectral gap inequality for L2, there's an analog for any norm where I get some minor loss in the parameters. So basically what he proves is that this random experiment, when I take two random points and compute the distance in the norm squared, I can always upper bound the, basically, the average spread of the points by the average spread of the edges times log d squared over lambda 2. Okay. But basically, by the same argument, 
if I impose that this, gra this map f was one Lipschitz, then this would always be at most one. And getting a bound saying that my points are spread out is giving me a lower bound for this, and thus an upper bound for lambda 2. Okay? What this means is that for any norm, I can say that the cutting modulus is at most log d over epsilon squared. Why? Because if I don't have a cluster of this, um, of this size, of this radius, then this is giving me a lower bound on this average distance between points of log d over epsilon squared squared. And that's how you get the upper bound on lambda 2. Okay. Good. OK, so the main theorem, if you combine the data structure I gave, assuming an upper bound on the cutting modulus with this inequality, then you can already get that for any norm space x and any epsilon, there exists a self-row data structure which achieves approximation log d over epsilon squared using space <coughs> d times n to the epsilon and memory probes d, uh, d times n to the epsilon, sorry, space d to the n to the 1 plus epsilon. Okay, so is that, that's good. Okay, good. Okay, so that's basically the second part, talking about the cutting modulus and how to get self probe data structures. Assuming you have this um, sort of theorems that say either there's a ball or there's a cut. Okay. So okay, now I'll go on, and I guess the best way to start is to say why is the data structure self-probe? So why couldn't I get time-efficient algorithms? And the argument was that I was able to encode this particular LSH partition of my space using poly D times like poly D log n bits, so I can <coughs> write this tree in small space, but what I really need is an efficient algorithm that helps me traverse down the tree. Okay, so I really need to understand that each point, okay, if I have a ball node, then there's a, you can just store the center and traverse in that, but if I have a cut, even though I can, there's an encoding of that cut into a few number of bits, what I really need is an efficient way to determine when I walk down during the query procedure, whether my query point will be on one side of the cut or the other side of the cut. So this is like the main challenge. Um, okay, so let's go a little bit over how, w what the data structure actually would look like. So what we did is we said, okay, let's take this graph, and this graph is a discretization of all my points in like, s all the points that I'll ever, ever observe. So the number of points here will be exponential in the dimension, so e to d log d, and these are my points. And now I said, if there's no dense ball, so if I don't have a cluster, then by the inequality that Asaf Noor proved, then I have an upper bound on lambda 2, which means there is an eigenvector that realizes this bound, in particular this Rayleigh quotient with the normalized Laplacian is at most epsilon squared, and then I applied Cheeger's inequality to find this particular cut s. Okay. Now what I do, I need, I need an algorithm that decides whether Q belongs to S or Q is not an S. And the problem is that this cut was a, a cut in some graph of exponential size. But I really want, um, I want to represent in some sense this combinatorial cut in more like geometric terms to allow me to, um, to find algorithms. So is, is the main, is the challenge cut? Yeah. So I guess question, why can't you use linear space to represent this? Like, what's the, why is it too much space if we right. each cut in linear, in linear in the smaller side of, the smaller of S and S prime? Good, because the graph <coughs> is of size um, e to the d log d. So if you store the nodes lying on the smaller side of the cut, you could potentially be storing e to the d log d. Okay. Right, so even, there's a better encoding of this cut, oh, you, the, but the checking. Space. Sorry? Yeah, yeah, exactly. Okay, good. Um, okay, good. So the cut that we used in the cell probe data structure, this cut S, was obtained by applying Cheeger's inequality to the vector V, which is proven like it's, we know it exists from the inequality, uh, the nonlinear spectral gap inequality, but we have no control as to what this vector V is. Okay, in particular, the proof of Cheeger's inequality says that this cut S can be realized as follows. You take the V, the vector which achieves this upper bound on this Rayleigh quotient, and then you order them according to 
um, the values, and that there's going to be some threshold where if you consider all the values of vi which are less than this threshold, then this corresponds to one side of the cut, and all the values which are greater correspond to the other side of the cut. So that's the cuts that we're using. The problem is we have no control of this eigenvector, and it's like very, very large. So there is, the, yeah, right. OK, so the high level question was, can we achieve these bounds on the cutting modulus with a family of efficient cuts? So can you somehow use the fact that these points actually lie in some high dimensional vector space to use the structure of the vector space to allow you to cut the graph? So the, let me, an example would be the following. Imagine the cut S was realized by some hyperplane. So in some sense, I want to prove that my points are, so my graph is given by the vertices whose points are in some vector space. And in addition, there's going to be some cut of the space, so some just evaluation of a dot product, where if you take the cut given by the points which lie on one side of the hyperplane, then this is, has a cut of low conductance. Then checking whether a particular point Q is on one side of the cut or not simply corresponds to looking at that point and computing the dot product with H and checking whether this is bigger than or less than tau. So all I would need to store, I would need to store this vector H and this um, threshold tau. It would be like a very efficient way to store the cut. Another example would be, OK, ideally I could have my cut that's realized by a ball. So maybe this graph, I can find a center point and some threshold tau such that if I look at all the points in my graph contained at distance at most tau from this center point B, then this gives me a cut of the graph. And maybe, hopefully, that cut has good conductance. If I can prove that that was true, then checking whether Q lies in my cut or not simply corresponds to computing a distance in the norm. Yeah. So just to clarify, so f would be like some sort of embedding from your like exponentially large space into a hopefully much lower dimensional space. Right, so think of f as just being the representation of where your points are. So you're already getting the point after it's being embedded into the space. Ah. Yeah, oh, so, that's true, I yeah. Oh, yes, because so, you don't actually get an exponentially large square. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So you're already getting the point. OK, um, so right, hopefully I could prove these two theorems. I'll give you what we can actually show. And it, it'll still be efficient. So what we can show is that actually there exists an efficiently computable function from RD to RD such that the cut is given by first applying the function and then taking a hyperplane. Okay? This is still efficient because checking if a point Q belongs to my part one side of the cut or not corresponds to computing this function on the point and then checking a dot product. Okay. okay. So let me claim that actually using the for L2 sort of things are good in the sense that what did we say? By the spectral gap inequality, this experiment of taking, uh, basically I'm just rewriting the linear spectral gap inequality, saying in L2, if I take the average distance between edges and the average distance between pairs squared, if I have this upper bound of epsilon squared, then there exists a k, which is some projection of my points into some coordinate, such that re they realize this radical quotient. This is just um, some sense uh, manipulation, how you can prove this, uh, this inequality. So are you eventually going to just get an inner product space or not? So uh, here. I mean, you just defined two inner products before, right? Two kernels. The hyperplane, but you know, inner product, and there's another embedding on the sphere inner product. So are you just going to define a support vector machine? So... Just out of curiosity, I mean, is that what I should be looking for? You're going to be in a Hilbert space? Right, so in the end I'm going to map to a Hilbert space, but it's going to be through some complicated map. I don't think it's... It's not going to have a nice inner, simple inner product? Mm, no, no, it's not going to be a simple map. Like, we compute it through some complex so program. Linear? No. Yeah. Um, okay, so... Right, so, okay, so I claim that for L2, sort of this, the linear spectral gap inequality applying, so already gives me that the points <coughs> where they lie, some projection of those points are actually achieving an eigenvector which gives with an upper bound on this Rayleigh quotient. In particular, I can apply Cheeger's inequality to this um, vector F projected on K. Okay. 
So what this means is saying, you, have, you give me any graph where the vertices lie in, as points in L2, and the, the graph has no ball, then there exists a projection of these points onto some coordinate. So pick a coordinate k. There's going to be one coordinate for which the vector gotten by projecting my points down to this coordinate is achieving a uh, rally quotient which is less than epsilon squared. In particular, I can apply Tigers inequality just to the projection. And just by the proof of Tigers inequality, this corresponds to looking at a coordinate and cutting according to a threshold on that coordinate. Okay, so for L2, I'm getting very, very nice cuts. It's saying if you have a graph, the <coughs> points are sort of spread out, then there exists some coordinate where just a, a cut on this coordinate achieves conductance at most epsilon. Okay. And the question now is, can we reduce the statement of any norm into L2? So is there a way to translate, can we say the same thing um, by maybe possibly embedding? So OK, what I need is I need to design a function f, which takes my points in my norm space and maps them into L2, such that I can control the ratio of L2 distance squared between points that are connected by an edge and points, just random points. OK? Yeah. Right, good. So this, I mean, in some sense, it's, uh, it, you can do it, you do it with cheaper than equality, and I get, it's not computationally efficient, but this comes as a pre-processing stage. So this is coming, yeah, this is before I get the query. So once I have the query, I already have this partition laid out. So okay, ideally, I want to design a function which helps me reduce any norm to L2, and I can control this expectation of random points at distance squared after applying this function, and the expectation over random edge of the distance squared after applying this function. Okay, and here I could use John's theorem. Okay, and I would be able to say that the distances are preserved up to factor square root d. But what John's theorem is doing something stronger. John's theorem is preserving every single term inside the expectation, and I only need a guarantee on average. Okay, so that's like the main the main reason why we're able to get improved algorithms because even though John's theorem is sort of tight for these worst case embeddings, if I need this average guarantee, I can do much better. OK, good. So I'll show you how you can instantiate this idea to get nice coordinate cuts for LP. So go beyond L2. And here we'll talk about the Maslow map. So the main lemma is the following. If you give me any graph, and you give me an embedding into an LP space, which is one Lipschitz, so I don't stretch edges, Either there exists a ball of radius p over epsilon with constant fraction of the points. Either my points are clustered with um, <coughs> radius p, or there exists an efficiently computable function and a coordinate and a threshold such that I can compute this function, look at a coordinate, and cut the, and cut the graph according to that coordinate and some threshold. And that cut satisfies conductance at most epsilon. Okay. So in some sense, this would tell me that I can achieve my bounds in the cutting modulus of p over epsilon, because that's the radius of the ball. But in addition, I get a very efficient way of representing these cuts. Basically, apply this computable function, and then project onto coordinate k, and cut at threshold tau. OK? OK, so let's do this. I'll tell you what the transformation is. And this is the Maslow map, and it's what you were saying before. Basically, I'll take each point. In order to map a point x1 through xd <coughs> from LP into L2, I'll take each point, I'll raise it to power p over 2, and multiply it by a sign. Okay. It's like a very efficient map. And just like a very quick calculation, what you can confirm is that the LP norm to the p of a particular vector is the same as the L2 norm squared. And in some sense, giving me a relation from LP to the p to L2 squared. And this map is, sort of, is not, a it's not a good embedding, but it's not a terrible embedding. So I can relate the distances between x and y in some way by the distances between x and y. So after applying the Maslow map on x and y, the distance between 2 and L2 squared is at most p times the distance between x and y and L2 squared plus this factor that degrades as the norms get larger. And I'll mention that you could try to design an algorithm by just using this as an embedding. The problem is that 
the embedding is really getting bad as your vector is getting bigger. So this would give approximation something like 2 to the p. But you could. But in some sense, I'm not going to use it to embed my points. I'm going to use it just to prove to you that there exists a good cut. So in some sense, I'm not I'm, even though I'm distorting distances in the proof of the existence of a cut, in the algorithm, I, already, I know that there's a good cut, and I'll just use this cut. I don't need to be moving the points around. Okay, so let's just do a rough calculation to understand how the expectations between random points and random edges are transformed when I apply the Maslow map. So if I have a function, if I have, let's think of this graph, no p, and now imagine there's no LP ball of radius p over epsilon with constant fraction of the points. <coughs> what that roughly means is that the expectation of the points, the LP norm to the p, is roughly p to the p, and after applying the map, the L2 norm, the L2 squared is roughly the LP norm to the P. So we get that after applying this map, the average distance between points should be bigger than P over epsilon to the P. Just like a very rough calculation. But now I can use the fact that this Maser map was not a terrible embedding to say that for any edge, if my points are a distance at most one, then I'm going to get some upper bound on the distance between um, my points in L2 after applying the Maslow map. This is just applying this inequality here. I can say that this is at most 1. And I get this upper bound of p squared times p over epsilon to the p minus 2. Okay. In particular, if I take the ratio of this 2, if I take this experiment that I did in L2, now I'm still getting that the ratio of the distance is upper bounded by epsilon squared. And means that I can apply Cheeger's inequality to the vector obtained by transforming my points according to f, and then working as if I were in L2. Okay. Okay, good. So what does that mean? Basically, just to unpack this whole thing is that for LP norms, there exists a data structure which just does the data structure of the cutting modulus. But at each time that I traverse down the tree, there was a very efficient way to decide whether a point belongs to one side of the cut or to the other side of the cut. Just by computing this Maslow map and then projecting to a coordinate and checking whether it's bigger than some threshold. Okay. And we can get that we get an algorithm with approximation p over epsilon using space poly d times n to epsilon and time poly d times n to the epsilon. Okay, so in some sense I'm getting some now efficient algorithm, not a self probe algorithm, but for LP norms. Okay, um, how much time do I have? Okay. Good, so I guess what I'd like to do is to tell you about how to do this for any norm. And basically, we want to obtain these kinds of arguments that I just gave for LP, but for general norms. <coughs> so, yeah, Jen's theorem will do the trick, but uh, we'll always be losing square root d, and we want to be able to preserve these averages. So I'll try to come up with a computable map, which is analogous to the Maslow map. So analogous to this map that raises each um, coordinate to the power of p over 2, but can you do this in any norm? Okay. And so I guess there exists some good map. It was a construction of uh, Daher in 93. And it's somewhat analogous to the Maslow map, but it's a, l a little bit different. So the idea is like this. We'll start with any norm here. So this is any convex body. In the end, we want to map into L2 such that we can relate distances in L2 by distances in the original space. Okay, so what we can show is that in some sense, you don't have a nice map between the two, the two convex bodies, but a small perturbation of both convex bodies, then you have a map which is analogous to the Maslow map. Okay, so in some sense, if I can take my body and I perturb it a little bit by some polynomial factor in D, and perturb my units, my, my L2 ball, then I can find a, a nice um, map that, in some sense, it's not linear. It's like has this uh, holder continuity guarantee, but it gives me something that's, in some sense, very similar to the LP case. And this, just to contrast this with John's theorem, so John's theorem is just wrapping it inside and out. Here we're applying this perturbation and then taking a nonlinear map and applying another perturbation. Okay. But basically, now, the, we 
the, the main statement is the same. Um, now, after applying this map, we can say that for any norm in any graph, if there's no dense ball of radius 2 to square root log d, then I can apply this map, and then that, those points, now I can think about as living in L2, so there exists a coordinate cut of conductance at most epsilon. So after applying this, this sort of complicated map, you can achieve, but it's, we can compute. It, the main point is that this map is efficiently computable. Uh, and the proof is really analogous to the LP case. So, yeah, in some sense the work is showing that you can compute this map, um, these maps which we do with like um, just a convex program. But yeah, this is all, and I guess I'll sum I'll finish with some open problems. So I guess specific to the approximate new statement problem, I guess the next step is to try to understand bounds of the cutting modulus for other metric <coughs> spaces, maybe that aren't norm spaces. So spaces some, such as like edit distance, it's not a norm space, and um, earth mover distance, okay, so earth mover distance can't be uh, represented as a norm space, but you could potentially get much better bounds than what we have. And right, another direction would be to try to understand the cutting modulus, but rather that in edge expansions that would be characterized by conductance, but more like vertex expansion. And there's some indication that you could get better algorithms in this approach. Another question is just doing this with efficient preprocessing. So all I argued was all my efficiency was during the query time, but in order to find these cuts, in order to just work with um, these things, I'm using time which is proportional to the size of the graph, which is exponential in D. And I guess more broadly, it'd be really good to try to get these like nice geometric cuts when I rule out clusters of log D, not just two to square log D. Reason because we know that there exists a cut uh, once you rule out um, balls of radius log D. It'd be really, uh, be really nice to say, okay, this cut is also like very efficiently decided with some algorithm. Okay, even though we currently we don't know how to prove this. And I guess uh, it would be nicer to get simpler cuts. So these cuts were kind of like kind of complicated. You had to apply this um, convex program. Uh, but maybe you could prove that there exists some simpler ways of cutting these graphs in norm spaces. Okay, and finally, um, it'll be nice to kind of try to take these ideas and see, okay, sort of in, in approximate nearest neighbors, we always thought that um, worst case embeddings would be what you need to, when it's something, the natural notion to apply these data structures, it turns out that there's you need a much weaker guarantee, these average case embeddings, and this is sort of what you really needed to make this go through. So it'd be nice to see if in other parts of algorithms you can actually use these ideas as well. But yeah, that's all. Thanks. So can you maybe mention a little more about that map you were talking about? Sure. Um, so, okay, so this map works as follows. <coughs> um, there's this notion in norm spaces called complex interpolation. Oh. It's basically, there's a, it's a way to take one norm space and get like a, a family, like a continuous family of norm spaces which goes from one to the other. And if you can assume that these norm spaces are this thing is called uniformly con convex, then you can, then in some sense this map is really just naturally interpolating between, like all the norm spaces in between are naturally interpolating. So in some sense you need to make this um, complex interpolation algorithmic. In particular you need to be able to compute, say if I give you like oracle access to two norms, I want to compute the norm of a particular point x at the interpolated distance like between these two spaces. And that you can write as a convex program and solve it with known techniques. I see, and like these two perturbation things, does that come from like getting close to a uniformly convex? Exactly, so then you apply, if you apply um, complex interpolation to any normal space, you get close to uniformly convex. If one of your spaces is uniformly convex, the other one is not, you perturb it a little bit. Uh, and right, that's like the tension between this 
the better you can get. Um, the more you perturb it, the nicer map you get, but then you're losing here. And then, yeah, so there's the tension between the two. And you're perturbing it with something that's like super uniformly convex or something? Yeah, with just Hilbert space, so L2, ah, okay. yeah. So you start any norm, you perturb it with L2, and yeah, then you have the map between the two. And, yeah.